Hi everyone, and you're all very welcome to this third seminar series of the Transform Work events here this week in, in DCU. My name is Idel Conway, I'm Professor of HRM and Organisational Psychology in DCU Business School, and I also lead the Future of Work strand within IIDB. I'm going to be your MC for today's event with um, Michelle Humphreys, Jerry Lavin, Denise White-Hughes, and Neve Carroll. Um, as you may know, the Transform series is uh, a number of online free events uh, that will focus on the impact of digital transformation on business and society. And uh, we'll be covering a, a wide range of issues from smart cities to circular economies. Um, today, however, we're going to be focusing on the future of work. And I'm really delighted to be joined by Michelle Humphreys, uh, who's Vice President of Citrix, uh, EMEA uh, Customer Success, Jerry Lavin, who's Product Strategist with Citrix, uh, Denise White Hughes, who's Head of Employee Relations at Lidl Ireland, and Neve Carroll, who's Head of Talent Management at Lidl Ireland, Northern Ireland. Um, particularly exciting is that today we're going to focus on sustainable development goals uh, that have been devised by the United Nations. And the particular goal that we're going to focus on is an important one. It's SDG 8, and that one relates to decent work and employment and um, uh, economic growth. Um, so please feel free to uh, send in your questions. The, the chat function is enabled, but you can send your questions in via the Q&A, which is at the bottom of your screen. Um, so the chat function is disabled. So we look forward to your questions. Please send them in. And towards the end of each session, uh, hopefully we'll get around to asking those questions of our guest speakers. So without further ado, I will hand you over to Michelle and to Jerry. And you're very welcome. And thanks so much for your time today. Great, thank you so much for, for the invite, uh, for inviting us. We're delighted to present. Um, I'm going to hand you over to Jerry. He's going to go through um, what sustainability means to Citrix. Um, he, he kind of present uh, a, a short presentation, and really, we're both available for questions at the end. So, Jerry, I'm going to hand over to you. Thanks, Michelle. Um, yeah, and thanks for this opportunity to talk about um, sustainability in general. Um, I, I'd like to give a little overview of, of Citrix's thoughts on the sustainability, what we're seeing our customers do and, and some trends we're seeing in the industry as well. And as Michelle said, um, very open to questions and, and love to hear your thoughts on this. Um, I am doing the typical meeting thing and just struggling to share my screen at the moment. So just bear with me a second. Hopefully you should be able to see this now. Um, so sustainability um, and, and specifically our, our view on sustainability. Um, I, I'd like to start by just talking a little bit um, on how we position um, or how we discuss sustainability with our customers. Um, Idel already mentioned the UN Sustainable Development Goals, and we've used that as kind of a basis of our framework um, for discussing this and looking at what we can do as an organization, uh, both to become more sustainable ourselves and, and to support our, our customers. Um, and really to boil it down, our view is sustainability is ensuring that our actions today don't limit the range of economic, social, and environmental options that we leave open to future generations. Um, we believe that we as an organization have a, a large part to play in supporting business models for our customers. And they in turn, um, through the power of business, uh, through governance, uh, through working you know, cross organizationally, um, can have big impacts on um, resource utilization and our, our approaches to the development of the economy as well. 
Um, and this is backed up by a lot of key trends that we're seeing out there. I, I just pulled some of these. This is constantly shifting space. Um, but we're seeing growth on the economic side. We're seeing growth in the government and government side as well. Um, pressure from the ECB, um, changing in EU policies, announcements in the UK and in Ireland around you know, green industrial revolution. The Project Ireland 2040 has a, um, a, a major bioeconomy element in there as well. We're also seeing shifts on consumer and end user side as well. So there's a very interesting search trend from Google. In the last 40 days, uh, they've seen, uh, sorry, in the last, in the first 90 days rather of uh, the COVID um, pandemic, they saw a four and a half thousand percent increase in people searching for how to live a sustainable lifestyle. Um, we're seeing as well, regulators and government bodies putting increased pressure on organizations as well to decarbonize, to support the UN development goals, um, to make better decisions uh, for the planet um, and better decisions for their employees as well. Um, from a Citrix perspective, um, we see two major areas where IT um, and Again, for those of you in the audience who um, may not be aware of us, Citrix is an organization that is helping um, our customers transform um, and move to, a, um, move to digital workspaces um, to achieve um, business outcomes for their employees, helping them work from any location, um, helping them um, support their staff to be their most productive. And part of that is looking at IT efficiencies and areas that we can both um, help those individuals and organizations be more productive, but also help them achieve their sustainable goals as well. So true research that we've done um, internally and with third parties, um, we found that IT uses about 10% of all business electricity um, in Europe. And that commuting um, approximately uses, it accounts for 27% of all miles traveled. Now, when we add those up, um, we see that electricity accounts for 2.3% of global emissions. So they're in, um, um, created by ICT. And by that, I mean both server farms themselves, but also the cooling, um, the air con related to those as well, end user devices and the manufacturer of those. And commuting accounts for 2.8% of global emissions. So combined, that generates 2.7 billion tons of CO2 every year that's released into the atmosphere. Um, and to help you picture that um, maybe a little differently, the amount of forestry required to sequester that is equivalent to the size of Canada and Greenland combined. So every year we're pumping enough CO2 into the atmosphere that will require exceptional levels of tree planting or other um, methods to remove that from the atmosphere. And we can see this as a, an impact. This is a, um, a graph from the, um, the NOAA um, on climate change, um, looking at um, trends that we're seeing um, within uh, carbon dioxide concentrations within the atmosphere. And we can see that we're at a, an unprecedented point um, and that makes for an uncertain future. Um, and obviously governments and, and organizations and individuals are aware of that. And that underpins a lot of the actions that we're trying to take to move to a, a lower carbon economy, um, but at the same time address the needs of individuals as well um, to have a reasonable place to work, to have um, good expectations of good outcomes. Now, for if we want to take a positive from this uh, stat here, the 50% of IT greenhouse gas emissions are driven by inefficiency. The positive for me is that it means we have something we can um, double down on. We can look at how we can tackle those inefficiencies. And I'll talk a little bit more detail on that as I go through the rest of this presentation. But from our perspective, we really see this as being driven by inefficient devices, the end user devices that, that people use to get their work done on a daily basis, inefficient data centers where the servers that run those applications are hosted and unnecessary commuting. Um, and I know the, the last one, 
may seem a little bit of a strange topic for us in this current situation where none of us have done very much commuting, um, probably in 2020. I know I've done a lot less than I used to, but the trends we're seeing of a gradual return to work um, will mean that this is going to be become an important topic again. And I think it underpins another topic as well. Where do we do our work? Do we have a workspace, um, an area that we're free to think, that we're free to innovate, that we're free to, to do the work that we need to do, or is it tied to a specific place? Um, and I think there's both obviously carbon or decarbonization benefits to decoupling work from a specific place, but there's also in, in benefits to the individual as well. Um, benefits around work-life balance, dem benefits about democratizing the access to work and benefits for an organization to open up and tap into other talent pools, other parts of the workforce that weren't available to them if everything was tied to a specific geographical location. So we at Citrix have really looked at four key areas where we can help our customers um, around decarbonization, um, around achieving ESG goals um, to make them both a more sustainable organization from an environmental uh, viewpoint, but also a better place to work as well. So those are allowed around low energy device choice, secure, flexible remote working, low emission efficient cloud computing and extending device useful life cycle. So we're gonna start off by looking at power consumption. Um, and we're going to use an example of a, um, a company with a thousand users. Um, so a mid-sized company, a thousand users, um, you can you know, uh, picture whoever you'd like for this. Um, but again, with a very traditional mix of device types in there, some laptops, some desktops, um, people working from office locations. So that organization on the end user compute side, the actual devices that they use to get their work done day to day are creating about 104 or use, consuming about 114 kilowatts a year of electricity, which in turn generates about 80 tons of CO2, which requires about 48 football pitches of forestry to sequester from the atmosphere. Now, if we look to move those organizations to more efficient computing devices, devices which are lower energy and better managed, and we have a very good case study on this with the University of Cambridge, who we helped to move from high energy desktops to highly efficient Raspberry Pi computers um, with, very with no knock on detriment to the end user experience. I think that's the piece that's key. Um, we want to achieve these without impacting the end user and still allowing those end users to have a great experience. We saw um, we're able to achieve a 90% emission reduction on average and, and more for some organizations as well. Um, secondly, if we look at reducing emissions from, compute, uh, from commuting, again, uh, obviously a topic that's um, slightly changed this year, but for many organizations, they, some people have, to con have continued to have to commute, even though there's been announcements from Facebook, from Barclays and others about you know, a, a slow return to office or a, maybe a, a rethink of how they use their hub city center offices there will be a return to commuting. And, and commuting is important. Um, seeing your colleagues, the social aspect of that, the interactions, the options to um, brainstorm to together and um, come up with ideas in unstructured ways are important. What we're talking about here is unnecessary commuting. Um, what in many organizations presented itself as presenteeism. You had to be in the office to be seen to be doing work. Um, in the UK, uh, where these da this data is based on, um, it, together, if we combine the average number of miles, the average number of workers uh, over 238 days, um, we're seeing something like 3 million commuting miles being traveled. Um, so that, again, to put it into perspective, will require nearly 700 football pitches of forestry to sequester that from the atmosphere. Now for this organization, if they were to reduce their commuting by just two days a week, and I think if nothing else this year has proved to us that we can be productive from a remote, we can be productive um, when we're not in the office. And if organizations adopted that as a policy going forward, um, that have, can have profound knock-on effects um, to um, an, an, uh, an organization's attempt to decarbonize. But it can also have profound effects on 
um, where they can um, hire their employees from, where they place their offices, um, and it gives them options and provides options um, to their employees as well. And we're seeing more and more evidence that this hybrid approach to working um, supports both decarbonization goals, but other sustainable and ESG goals as well. Um, it gives better work-life balance and opens up opportunities for individuals in the organization where they fix nine to five, Monday to Friday approach was not suitable and in some ways may have hindered their ability to, um, to work or hindered their ability um, to continue to be an engaged member of that organization. Uh, thirdly, we're gonna look at, um, I, I'd like to talk about reducing greenhouse gas emissions from data centers. Um, you've probably seen things in the media race recently about the impact of cloud computing. Um, and, and that's real. Um, I think that's something we all have to consider. But what we've really seen is that a lot of on-premises data centers are highly inefficient. Uh, they generate um, a lot of carbon due to um, heating or sorry, cooling and air conditioning requirements. Um, they're often running on older inefficient technologies and they're often running at a scale um, where they can't be um, take advantage of the latest capabilities. Finally, they may not have access to uh, the necessary green electricity um, that larger hyperscalers may have access to. And if they do have access um, to greener, lower carbon electricity, they're very unlikely to be adding or providing additionality back into the grid as well. Um, secondly, there's um, the reporting requirements as well. Um, businesses are required to report their emissions and those emissions are divided into scopes. Um, Scope one is, are emissions directly created by an organization. So directly created during a manufacturing process. Scope two is electricity purchased for the organization's own, own use, for example, to run their data center. And scope three is supply chain related emissions. So when an organization moves from on-premises uh, to cloud computing, it removes that part of those emissions that would have been reported as scope two and they become scope three or supply chain emissions. Um, this has benefits to organizations. Um, the majority of listed organizations and private sector organizations and public sector entities have to report those scope and, um, emissions. So it simplifies the reporting. But this isn't just some attempt at greenwash and moving those um, um, those numbers are kind of fiddling the books, is really an opportunity to take um, inefficient, um, energy hungry commuting, computing, move it to the cloud where it can access and take advantage of carbon zero computing that's provided uh, by Microsoft, by Amazon and by Google as part of their platforms as well. And continue to take advantage of the developments that they have there in their moves to be, move beyond carbon neutral into carbon negative and um, as they develop newer capabilities to sequester and move carbon that they've previously created. Um, finally, I'd like to talk a little bit about extending the life cycle of devices. Um, so we talked already about the ability to move to lower power devices, and that becomes possible because of the way we um, manage the delivery of the compute. Um, so by that, I mean that if the, power hungry part of the computing is happening somewhere else in a data center in public cloud, the end point where the end user can consume that computing doesn't have to be as powerful. So it could be a Raspberry Pi, as I mentioned earlier, it could be a low power Chromebook, it could be a tablet, rather than a higher power device with all the management overhead and, and the power requirements of that. But what if an organization is already invested heavily into devices? Um, and doesn't want to necessarily refresh those. What we can look to do for that organization as well is extend the device um, because a large part of the greenhouse gas emissions are created during the manufacturing phase of that device. So if we can extend the usability of that device beyond the traditional three-year life cycle refresh, out to five years, we've even worked with some organizations to get that to seven years. Um, we have the opportunity then to provide both a great experience to the end users, um, 
and to help drive down costs for organizations as well. But all of that while achieving reduction in greenhouse gas emissions and at the same time, reducing the amount of electronic waste that's going into landfill. So some of the changes that have occurred over the last few years have made it more and more difficult to recycle economic waste. Uh, China no longer, uh, or sorry, electronic waste. China no longer accepts electronic waste from overseas. It means that um, locally um, we've had to scale up our ability to recycle, or we've had to work with other countries on recycling as well. In many cases, it means electronic waste is going into landfill. So anything we can do to make devices last longer, extend those life cycles, becomes key to grow. Uh, driving down greenhouse gas emissions in the, um, in the um, production phase, but also dr uh, driving down the total greenhouse gas emissions related to the device life cycle as well. Um, and in real terms, again, looking at our thousand user company that can uh, have, you know, look at reductions, um, uh, sorry, the impact can be the, of early uh, recycling or early um, a termination of the use of those devices can be the equivalent of an additional 40 tons of CO2 into the atmosphere. Um, so if we have opportunities that can drive that down and extend that over time, um, we can have significant impact in that organization. So if we look at these combined capabilities, the um, ability to use lower energy devices, the ability to work from any location. And I think that's key to the, uh, the point um, that was made earlier about the sustainability, sustainable development goals and the desire to you know, provide people with a, a, a decent um, opportunity to work as well. Um, the same technologies that underpin the ability to uh, reduce sustaining or reduce um, commuting requirements also underpin the ability to allow people to work from locations where they couldn't traditionally work from. So these may be locations remote from central cities, so remote from Dublin or remote from London near where I live. Um, they could be parts of the labour force that have found it difficult to, to return to work. Um, we've done a lot of work with um, contact centres where we're opening up staffing opportunities to um, demographics that found it more challenging before, um, specifically mothers who want to return to work, um, where there's childcare concerns, the ability to remove that commu com commuting element, not only help that organization dr drive down some of its CO2 uh, numbers, but also opened up that opportunity to that workforce as well. So additional ESG benefits on top of that as well. Um, the use of cloud computing um, has the benefits of flexibility and the ability to take advantage of new services, but also to take advantage of the work those hyperscalers are doing to drive down their own greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and their move to use um, renewable energies, carbon zero, um, and moving eventually to carbon negative technologies as well. And finally, device life cycle. I think we can all agree that anything we can do um, to reduce the amount of electronic waste that's going into landfill has to be a benefit, but it's also benefits to organizations as well because it supports them um, by freeing up budget that can be used uh, instead of using unnecessarily recycling devices, using that budget um, in other ways to provide more innovative solutions for their users. So for this thousand person organization that have adopting sustainable IT practices underpinned by our technology and the technology of our partners, um, we can make over a year, again, for this theoretical company, a savings of over 670 acres of forestry that would be needed to plant it to sequester the CO2 that they would have produced prior to adopting these practices. So again, practices that have knock-on benefits to the organization in other ways as well, reducing unnecessary commuting and hence opening up work opportunities for other parts of the organization, making those individuals more productive, allowing them to work from the spaces that they need to work from and giving them the opportunity to be more efficient and more engaged with the organization, driving down electronic waste, taking advantage of cloud computing services, um, 
and taking advantage of device types that um, are more energy efficient, easier to manage, um, and more suitable to the needs of the individual that are using them. Uh, and I think this all underpins our, our overall message to our customers. Um, we want to work with organizations to help them become more sustainable. It's part of our, our own challenge to us ourselves as an organization as well, to become more sustainable in our practices, because we genuinely believe that the technologies that will help their individuals become more productive, more efficient, more engaged, will make the organization more productive and engaged. But the, an organization who is willing to commit to sustainable practices is an organization who will be more attractive to the best talent out there. People want to work for organizations that share their own beliefs and their own goals. I think all of us have a goal um, or all of us would like to see a future that's a more sustainable future and one that's better for our planet. And if we can do that at the same time as being better for our businesses, I think it's an, it's an outcome that we can all support. Um, with that, I'd like to um, thank you for listening. Um, and I'll hand back to Edel um, just to see if we have any questions from the audience. Gary, thanks so much. That was so interesting and so much useful data there as well uh, in terms of um, sustainability and how that might apply in the workplace. Um, I have a tricky question, maybe. Um, sure. It's a general one, but it's just one that might get us pondering a little bit. Um, if we have less commuting and if employees are uh, working from home and they're not uh, driving and, and there are good savings from that, and if we have large offices that are now, let's say, operating at half capacity, um, and that's a good thing, hopefully, as well, um, there is evidence to suggest that, first of all, people working from home are not more productive, in fact, the opposite. Uh, there is also evidence that people are giving some of the commute time back to their companies. So, you know, rather than sitting two hours in a car, they might get up an hour later and, and begin work earlier. Uh, so they're giving more time. So where we have energy savings in one place, we might have less energy savings in another because people are now exerting their own energies more so. Um, and, and there are, you know, claims for increased uh, pressures and job demands and, and maybe sure. burnout of working from home. And also the energy that are, is being saved by people not being in their cars and in their offices is being transferred to the home. So I'm now using my electricity and, you know, so on to be able to work from home. And so is there a shift to workers now uh, in terms of energy, in terms of personal energies and in terms of, um, you know, using our electricity and so on to work from home? So, Idel, that's probably about five hours of conversation we could have in there, but I'll do my, I'll do my best to, <laughs> to try and to try and unpick that a bit. Um, I think, look, we we've all been in this giant social experiment for for nine or ten months and this is this is not normal work from home work from remote conditions I, I think we we can all accept that and I agree I think the numbers are mixed I, I think we see we are seeing productivity gains but again some of them are underpinned as you said by individuals working harder or working more or potentially committing it you know um, what do you call it eating into their own a family life or daily life as well to do this. But we're also seeing, I think, individuals who are, are making this work for them. So I think, if anything, we're in the infancy of remote work. Um, and I think some of the trends that I'm seeing is are a move away from remote work being seen as a HR conversation to one where it's a board level conversation. You know, how do we make, how do we industrialize it? How do we make it more efficient? How do we do it without burning our people out? Um, and how do we make it, you know, longer term, more sustainable? So, I mean, we're we're in a um, a technology company, so we often look at this through a technology lens about how can we make it an end user more efficient themselves. So we can maybe get rid of some of that rote work for them, the sort of task based work using AI and machine learning. But that's that's only part. Of the solution. I think it's an important part, but it's only part. 
So I think there's going to have to be cultural changes to do that. I think what we're seeing as well, as I mentioned earlier, there was you know, often a culture of presenteeism. We now almost have a digital presenteeism culture, where if you're not on Teams or you don't respond to WhatsApp or whatever in five seconds, you feel like your life's going to come crashing down. So I think there has to be a, a, a change in that. Um, sometimes that has to come through leadership. Sometimes it has to come through HR policy. So this is an evolving space. Um, I think the other part on the energy use is, is a very interesting one. There, is a, there was an article, um, I think I was reading in the FT today, um, about how the UK housing stock is some of the most inefficient in, in Europe. And having grown up in Ireland, I don't remember the insulation of my house being much better either. So, um, so there's a lot of work to be done in that space as well. I mean, the future, you know, they're talking about hydrogen boilers, about biomass, about, you know, energy uh, or heat pumps. That's still 10 or 15 years away. So there is, there is a, again, it's a balance between working from home and working in the office. And I think that's why I talked about a figure of two days per week. Um, I think Gartner has a statistic at the moment. They're saying by 2025, about 70% of COVID trends should be reversed. Um, maybe, again, this is a prediction, but I imagine we'll start to move back to the office. I think my key takeaway is let people commute if they need to commute, but don't force them to commute just because you've always had them commute. So this is an inflection point and a chance for us to think about the strategy of where we put people, where their locations are. And longer term, this may affect government policies. This may affect how new houses are built. Um, you know, wh will they have communal working areas in groups of houses? Will we bring people into, I think some of the banks are looking at reusing their branch locations as spoke offices. So if people commute, they don't have to commute as far. Um, and I think that's the areas that businesses who can think, um, differently and creatively about this are going to have real advantages. But it, I mean, it's a huge area, but I do genuinely think that if we can decouple work as a place from work as a thing you do, irrespective of where that is, it opens up possibilities, some of which have positive impacts on sustainability, some of positive impacts on work-life balance as well. Thank you, Jerry. Uh, that's a really good answer. Um, and I think as well, employees and, and the evidence is there to say that employees are going to demand more flexibility and demand uh, opportunity, yep. even for some of the time. I know a lot of people are missing their work colleagues and so on. Um, so if organisations don't respond, they will end up with retention issues and, and that's uh, non-sustainable as well. Um, I have a question here from Neve, and you did touch on it uh, in your uh, earlier presentation, but Neve wants to know in marketing, is your team finding it difficult uh, to come up with creative ideas in the virtual setting in comparison to being able to be in person and be able to bounce ideas or suggestions of people in the office? And maybe either Michelle or Jerry can, can answer that for us. Um, I, I can have a go first, since I'm involved in, in a number of events that we've been doing. Um, yes, it's more difficult, right? Um, I, I, I did a lot of face-to-face um, -face customer meetings. I did a lot of presenting in person. And it's hard to get the same levels of feedback um, in, an in, or in a virtual event. Um, I was reading uh, an article recently that even with video, it tricks our minds into thinking that we're getting all those physical cues that we get in a face-to-face -face meeting. But in reality, we're only getting parts of them, right? Um, so it, it's difficult, but I think if, in some ways it gives us some opportunities um, to, uh, you know, it opens up opportunities. I mean, if we were doing a physical event, it would have been difficult to get myself and Michelle and yourself and everyone together at the same time. Um, and I think that's opened up opportunities. We found as an organization that our, our leadership team are now, because they don't have to travel as much, more, more available for events, which is great. Um, I think though we, we have to realize that there's a bit of a sort of virtual event burnout happening as well. So I think yeah. anything that we do, it needs to be pithy, it needs to be sharp, it needs to be focused. It needs to answer one, two, three max questions for somebody and they can go away from it. So I think things like the TED Talk format, um, some of the more creative, 
even the influencers on YouTube, we probably have, you know, things we can learn from them. And, you know, I'm, I'm not going to try selling protein supplements on this now or anything like that. But I, I think it's just the, the idea that it, it needs to be very, very engaging. So what we're finding is there's an event we're planning for February, our, our, um, our Citrix and Mia Summit series. We're looking at, you know, short, sharp, pithy, trying to have different tracks for different individuals, um, making sure that the descriptions are good, that people are engaged, that it, they're able to work around their day and, and, and jump in and jump out, that there's some engagement and, and that there's a lot of follow up afterwards as well. I think pre and also preparation up front so that people know what they're getting when they come to an event. Yeah, I was just going. I was just going to add. Uh, I've I've just written an article in Women in Leadership, and I, it made me really look at my diary uh, and like, do I have you got necessary appointments in there? Are they really impactful? It does make you rethink that and, and really, you know, manage your time a lot better. Um, we also just on a on a kind of team morale level, um, keeping our team engaged. Um, we've done all sorts of things. I think we've got some wine tasting coming up. We've got race night events. Um, I, I know when we uh, first sent home everyone in Dublin, so there's 300, uh, nearly 300 people, you know, getting people in, more engaged, getting more connected with them, making sure we're checking in on them on a weekly basis. Um, we're trying to really you know, boost te the team morale, as well as, you know, making sure that we're reaching out to our customers as well. I think that's really important. So they feel engaged, they feel part of, you know, part of what we're doing. You know, we've been talking about remote working for 30 years. <laughs> we really had to put it to the test, as you can appreciate the past kind of 10 months. Um, so yeah, we've, we've done a number of things to keep people engaged uh, and we'll continue to do so. Yeah, in, in so many ways, it's such a positive outcome of a very, you know, right. unfortunate yep. situation that companies were catapulted into it um, and they managed to make it work, you know, quite quickly. So uh, hopefully we'll never go back to, to where we were before. Um, I, another very good question from Veronica. Um, she wants to know, like related to extending the life cycle of devices, given that many electronics companies business models build in planned obsolescence or limited backward compatibility, even just when it comes to cables and chargers and so on, is government intervention a must to enable this goal? Um, so I think for most of our sustainability related topics, it's going to have to be a mixture of government and governance. Um, I, I don't think it can purely be driven by, by government policy. Um, we're going to have to have industry themselves look at, at the benefits to them. I think the problem is, you know, we're, we're, we're a consumer society. Um, part of this is driven by our own behavior. We like shiny new things. Um, so part that's again driving the cycle of upgrades and driving the interest in, in the newest thing so we have every October we have big release events September October big release events for for new electronics coming out um, I think what we can look at is again there there may need to be government pressure on this I think if we as organizations and individuals are probably going to have to look at ways that we change our behavior around this as well. Um, so on the business side, as I said, we work with, with customers on looking at the device choice. And I think if we, you can say to your end users um, that I can give you a great experience, irrespective of the age of the device, within reason, right? Um, or I can give you a great experience, even if it's not a high powered device, the users are more willing to accept that. So this is the exact, again, the University of Cambridge example I was talking about with the, with the Raspberry Pi devices. These are low cost uh, devices, by like sub 100 pound devices, but we're able to give them a really good experience on the device, achieve their, their end user goals at the same time as achieving the sustainability goals as well. I think on the consumer side, yeah, we're still seeing the rush to, to go to the latest and greatest. I do think there's probably going to have to be 
a bit of consumer education in that space. There's potentially going to have to be regulation. And maybe that regulation really comes down to what happens to the device afterwards, right? Um, so a lot of the organizations already, or a lot of the companies already have uh, recycling programs. I think that's an area that we could strengthen things in. So um, forced recycling, um, more support with electronic recycling, um, a better ability to extend the life cycle of those devices as well. Um, and I think that the overlap of the consumer space into the business space has meant that, again, business leaders, IT leaders are under pressure to supply the latest and greatest. I think that's where we're trying to, to pivot that conversation that if we can still give a good experience, we can probably decouple that need and, and help you with, um, with not having to refresh as often. But I, I, at the end of the day, I think it's still going to come down a lot to individual behaviors. Um, if, we, if we want shiny new toys, we have to realize that there's an impact on that uh, related to that as well. Jerry, you've actually just answered the next question, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Yeah. Comes from <laughs> Uh, just in case, it, it, his question is a little yeah. bit more direct, but I think you've answered it. Is it an uphill battle to tackle e-waste when companies like Apple make so much money from people replacing their phones every couple of years? And do you think these market leaders are on board with the idea of tackling e-waste? Uh, I, I can't speak for Apple um, directly, but I think they realise as well that there's both a a sustainability or an environmental and a PR disaster waiting to happen or it, it, or at, it, they're at the beginning of happening. I think there's a they have a realization themselves. If you look into Apple's um, own reports on this, they spend, they invest heavily in recycling. They're trying to move away from, you know, dependencies on sort of rare earth elements. Um, we're even seeing it. I think Microsoft had an announcement recently about moving away from lithium-based batteries um, in their data centers as well. Um, so there's, there's a continual, there's a race, right? There's on one side, there's consumer demand and there's the demand on an organization to uh, achieve numbers. And then there's, uh, on the other hand, there's a realization that this isn't sustainable long-term. Um, so it, it, again, I think it comes back to there'll be, there needs to certainly be regulatory requirements here as well. There needs to be changes of, from individual behavior. Um, but I do think the organizations are aware of this um, and they're, they're trying to do more to achieve this. Like it, it's difficult, right? We, um, this isn't just down to electronic waste. This is down to, in many ways, the way that we've, we've lived our lives over the last 50 years or so. Thank you, Jerry. And just one final quick question. Um, uh, how many companies of the future will have very strict employee tracking software, eyes on screens and screenshots and time measurements and so on? Hopefully zero, um, but it's a growing area, right? There is, um, I, I had conversations with a, a couple of people from two large professional services companies. Um, one was very, had a, a culture of remote working and employee trust. The other one was thrown into it kind of at the, at the last moment with the current situation. One is very happy with how their users are working remotely. The other one has, still has to build that trust. So I think there, these may be stopgap solutions, you know, hands on keyboard. Are you watching, you know, are you attending the Zoom meeting? Are you watching the YouTube channel? At the, or are you doing both at the same time? Um, I think a lot of this will come down to building trust in the organization, um, building relationships with employees. I don't, I don't think the, the sort of big brother approach is going to be acceptable to many organizations. But again, there, there's people creating the software out there at the moment. I, I'd also um, have people kind of sit back and think, this is not normal remote working conditions as well. This is this sudden situation, uh, unprecedented, probably the most said word of, well, maybe not the most said word, probably COVID and vaccine are the most said words of 2020. I'm sure unprecedented is up there, but an unprecedented situation, we've all been thrown into, there's never been a sort of um, business continuity situation like this before. So 
people are going to react in unusual ways to this and they're going to take a while to get around this. And I really do think the remote working thing is here to stay and it's still in its infancy. So I hope it's not a future of, you know, somebody looking over your shoulder in a virtual sense. Um, and I really believe that, you know, if we can also move to a working model, which is based more on outcomes um, than time, which again, is as is, is, goes back to that attitude of digital presenteeism. If we focus on outcomes, then this becomes less of a concern. Absolutely. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's going to be very interesting to see you know, what will happen. And I think it, it really comes down to the culture of an organization and trust, as you say. And there might need to be a lot of managers who need to reprogram themselves uh, to be yep. more trusting in people at work. So, yeah, I think that's where the, the responsibility really will lie for making it work. Jerry and Michelle, I want to again extend a huge thank you. That was so interesting. Uh, so thanks so much for your time. And I know everybody is so busy. And as you say, we are more available to attend these kinds of events. Um, and, and it is putting you know, more pressure on your time as well. Um, but at least you don't have to uh, get into your car and drive to DCU. That's one of the advantages. So um, there's yep. savings there as well. <laughs> more savings on your time as well. So once again, thanks so much. Uh, I'm sure right. everybody really got an awful lot from that. Thanks very much, Ido. Great. Thanks, Thank everyone. Thank you. Uh, so, okay. everyone, uh, we're not yet finished. I'm delighted to say that we still have contributions from our other two speakers today, and that's Denise White Hughes, who's head of employee relations at Lidl Ireland, and Neve Carroll, who's head of talent management uh, at Lidl Ireland. So, I don't know which one of you are going to go first, but you're very welcome and very much looking forward to your presentation today. Great, thanks, Didel. So, hi everyone. Um, I hope everyone can hear me okay. Um, my name is Denise White Hughes, uh, and I'm here today with my colleague Neve Carroll. We're delighted to be part of today's event um, and to be discussing such an interesting topic. Um, as a business, sustainability is really important to us, so it is a topic close to our heart. But today, myself and Neve are going to focus on the the decent work piece. Um, so. We really thought about this and thought about what does decent um, really mean? Um, what does it mean to us? So we, as you do with all of life's really big and important questions, we ask Google. And Google defines the word decent as conforming with generally accepted standards of respectable or moral behavior. Um, so here at Lidl, we try not to just conform, but we do try to raise the bar. And um, so today, really, we're going to give you a, a whistle stop tour of all that we do to try to provide more than decent work for all of our employees. And um, so hopefully the this works. So um, although our head office is a very small portion um, of our overall employee population, I feel that how we work and how, um, yeah, how we work in our head office really represents um, how we work and what we, how we work as a business. So I'm going to play, and hopefully this works, um, a very short video that really gives you an insight into what the inside of Lidl looks like. It worked. So that's a quick insight into. Oh, I don't want that to play again. There we go. Um, into what our head office looks like. And just as I said, to give a, a brief oversight of who we are as a company. Um, so we opened our first stores in Germany in 1973. Um, and throughout the 1980s had huge expansion throughout Germany and um, in the 1990s then um, started our international expansion predominantly within Europe 
1999, we opened our first store in Northern Ireland and we celebrated our 20 year anniversary here in the Republic. Um, it was in 2000 that we opened our first store. Um, in 2001, we had over 190 stores um, and growing. In 2017, we entered um, the US, which has been a massive um, project and lots of our colleagues from Ireland went over to help with the setup. Um, yeah, and as of 2020, we have um, over 200 stores now in Ireland. Uh, and when we talk about Ireland, we talk about the entire island. So, and that's really a brief history of who Lidl are. Um, so today we're active in 32 countries, um, over 10,000 stores, um, with an employee base of over um, 287,000. We have 160 distribution centers. And as I said, the expansion in the US is um, fast and um, yeah, extensive. Within Ireland then, so our head office is based in Tala um, with over 350 employees, although um, not all there um, today. Um, most of us are working from home. We have over 200 stores and four distribution centers. So we have one in Charleville in Cork, Mullingar and Westmeath. We have one in Newbridge in Kildare and also then in this corner in Northern Ireland. And we have over 6,000 employees then on the island. Um, so as I said, um, with our stores, we have over 200 with over 3,000 and um, well over 3,000 state employees in our stores, our warehouses, we have the four distribution centers with over 700 employees there. Um, and in our head office, then we have over 27 departments and um, with over 350 employees, um, all of which are mostly remotely working now. So who we are and um, really and this kind of comes back to who we are and how we provide the decent work so Richard Branson and um, famously said clients do not come first that if you take care of your employees they look after your clients and this quote I suppose really resonates with us because we we do honestly believe that our employees are our greatest asset um, our values are the core to everything we do. So as cliche as it may sound, um, no two days are the same in Lidl. Uh, we are extremely fast paced um, with high levels of responsibility. And with that comes trust, respect and recognition from the company, but also from each other. Um, we are a dynamic and high performing um, cohort of employees who never forget that the customer is at the heart of everything that we do. So. I'm going to look at those values a little bit more now um, because as I said, that comes down to how we provide that decent work. So our first value, as I said, is respect. So how we define respect as part of our DNA is that Lidl is a melting pot of their ideas and people. We respect each other's differences and we're, um, and we're consistent and fair, but we also respect our workplace, our products and their origin and our customers. And sometimes respect is really as simple as helping each other out. It's hard work being this dedicated and um, a helping hand shows that you care. In regards to responsibility, then we serve the nation and that's a huge responsibility. As individuals and as a business, we are role models in every community where we work to our customers and to each other. Each and every one of us shares in that responsibility and we are always prepared to step in and step in when tasked with challenges. Uh, and I, I know COVID is like the ongoing topic for, for every conversation at the moment, but we've really stepped up to the challenge this year, but being one of the few retailers that remained open throughout this entire pandemic, all of our colleagues really had to step up to a challenge that none of us um, could foresee. Um, we don't just serve the local community, we're an important part of it. We have to be the best version of ourselves every single day. Yes, we're a shop, a warehouse, a support office, but we're also responsible for serving the next generation for fuel in Ireland and for giving people great food and great service that they can afford. Trust, um, our customers trust us to provide the best produce, the freshest food, the tastiest treats and a center aisle full of the best deals in the market. We trust each other to work hard, work smart and to bring our expertise and enthusiasm to work every day. And you can trust that the business um, to recognize your efforts, giving you the training and development you need, um, but also trust you with the freedom to be brilliant. Recognition. So 
honest feedback is so so important if if any of us can do things better we must that's how we stay ahead of competition but even more important than that it's um, recognition for a job well done whether it's financial rewards promotion a senior manager recognizing what a colleague does for a business or just simple a simple thank you from a customer that's what gets soul out of bed in the morning so that's who we are and who are what our dna is these are some of the charities that we support and um, that hopefully um, anyone who knows anything about Lidl will have seen some of this um, advertised. So we do a lot of work with the LGFA um, and Jigsaw are our current um, charity partner in IE and the NSPCC are in NI. And then there's another uh, of uh, a number of other causes that we support. So really to kind of get back into the how we provide or, or more details about the decent work. So we have um, 6,332 employees across the island of Ireland. To date in 2020, we re we've received 103,769 um, applications um, for positions and we've hired 1,992 new people um, in 2020. So some of the benefits um, at Lidl so something that we are extremely proud of is that we offer above and beyond what the minimum wage is and that we have um, continually um, matched the, the living wage for all of our hourly paid um, employees. That for everybody else within the business, we have extremely competitive salaries and we benchmark our salaries um, again using market research on a yearly basis to ensure that we are always um, yeah, being extremely competitive with what we pay. We have other nice benefits like a Christmas savings club, which I know is always a nice benefit come November when that gets paid out. Um, we provide health insurance through Leia um, for all of our salary paid employees. Um, we have bike to work schemes um, a pension scheme. So once you're in employment over um, one year, you can apply to be part of our pension, which is a really nice perk. We have an employee assistance program and um, once again we use through layout which is available to all of our employees and um, which is really really fantastic addition um, we have banking at work and um, fuel discount cards and then actual fuel cards for um, employees who have company cars um, and also something that's not the norm in the retail industry is having the paid and um, fully paid maternity and paternity leave and um, so we're definitely market leading in that. So really what all of this means is all of these elements together help us to provide a, a decent um, benefits package to well, more than decent benefits package to all of our employees. We also then have our well-being strategy um, and our well-being strategy is uh, what we call our work safe live well program. Um, and that's simply to look after every colleague's well-being, be it financial, health and safety at work. Um, our workplace well-being program helps us all to have a safer, happier and healthier workplace and life. So we divide up our work safe, live well program into three prongs. So we have our safety and um, our, our health and well-being and then financial well-being. And we do a number of campaigns every year um, and under each of these three headings. So just to give you a little bit of a flavor then um, into 2020 um, and once again, using the C word, but with COVID, obviously um, it's a lot more difficult to do these kind of more exciting campaigns and events and um, when you're limited to everything being online and virtually. Um, but I'm really proud of what we would still manage to achieve. Um, so the first thing was the, our healthy eating campaign. So an eat well cookbook, um, which was actually... Um, a really clever little idea where we had a cookbook made available to all employees using our products and we were really aiming it at our frontline staff so our, our colleagues in our stores and in our warehouses who um, weren't working at home and um, gave a cookbook full of things that you could make um, using only a kettle a toaster and a microwave and um, so some really nice ideas there we also then got some further employee engagement from it by having competitions of um, what do you make at work and, and um, use one of those recipes then in the actual cookbook. So Bryony, um, a customer assistant from our Shank Hill store got her um, tuna salad featured in the cookbook. And um, we also then made the cookbooks available for some of our other frontline workers in the hospitals just to help people 
stay healthy during um, such a stressful time. And we had a drink aware campaign. And once again, reminding people that it's, it's very easy to start that glass of wine earlier and when you don't have your commute. And so making sure people are aware of their, their own drinking habits. We then did a, a feedback survey during the year as well. We're, we're always very conscious that it's, it's very easy for us to decide what we think is important to people. Um, but we need to make sure that in, in regards to well-being and, and all things that we're, we're doing things because they matter and that we're doing things because it's what people want. Um, so making sure that we get feedback from our colleagues to see what do you want to see? Do you, do you want to hear more about mental health? Do you want to hear more about um, mindfulness? Um, or is there something else that people want us to, to develop more work on? So um, everything that we do is with that feedback in mind. Um, and it helps form our strategy again then for next year. Um, we did little campaigns about National Walking Day. We had quite a, a big campaign on mental health um, and had it featured uh, around the phrase of I'm fine. So we're very aware that when you're you're talking to a friend or a family member and ask how are you doing, that the, the normal response is I'm fine or I'm grand. And we're trying to just depict that a little bit. Um, we rebranded, I talked about the maternity and, and um paternity paid um, leaves and we developed that kind of leave program and rebranded it so we ha now have our, our loopy new family leave program um, which brings all of our family leaves together and trying to be more inclusive so previously when we talked about leave we um, we would have talked a lot about maternity leave and um, but now with the paternity leave, parental leave, the, the new parents leave, there's so many different leaves trying to bring it all together and to be a lot more inclusive um, and a lot more, not just about our, our female colleagues um, and really bringing it, trying to merge our internal and external brand better. So Loopy Lou is our, um, our kids range that you might've seen in store. And so merging those together. And we also were really, really happy to, to launch a, an additional leave program, which is our foster and leave program. Um, which now gives people paid time off to um, apply to be a foster parent and do part of their training and then an annual entitlement um, when you have a, a foster child assigned to you. Um, so once again, trying to make it more inclusive to all different types of families. Um, cold and flu um, campaigns this year, safety essentials in RDCs and stores, so more poster campaigns in European Safety Week. As I said, we have our health insurance for all of our salary paid employees, but we also offer a number of different discounts with Leia. So we're constantly trying to promote those and make sure people are aware of what they can get. And then we did a little bit more on retirement and how to prepare for retirement and helping people um, prepare for their own retirement. Um, so I, as, yeah, as I said, under very unusual circumstances, I, I, I think we managed to get a, a, a good few different types of campaigns across the line. Looking at 2021, then we want to look at more having monthly safety topics. How can we expand and um, further discounts? Looking at how can we amplify our banking at work? How can we do more in regards to our pensions? Um, as part of the feedback, we were told that um, budgeting is something that people would like to look more at and see can we have some kind of an app developed in regards to that. Tax saver schemes, doing more for the, the Christmas saving schemes looking more at the financial well-being um, side of it. Um, Dignity at Work, we did a, a huge kind of information campaign this year in regards to what is bullying, what is harassment, what is sexual harassment. Um, and next year, we're looking to bring that on another step and really train people on, well, what do you do when these things happen? Um, looking at stress reduction campaigns, um, nutrition and weight management, mindfulness, um, and then hopefully, um, hopefully we can get back to doing some of our normal events that we would have and um, so we would normally have summer events where we would um, have yeah barbecues we'd have family days in the zoo or in photo or the national stud in Kildare and um, so we're hoping to get back to those in our normal Christmas events and family Christmas events in, in our head office so um, we, we'll, we'll plan them and see what happens and um, and once again, as I said, um, so much of our feedback comes from, or our plans comes from the feedback that we get. So our, our pulse surveys, our annual survey, where our colleagues can all tell us how they're feeling. And if they put questions on, you know, their leadership and um, teams and um, communication and work-life balance, work environments and how we're doing. And once again, that helps us to ensure that we are, are providing good work and good employment for all of our colleagues. 
so I'm going to hand you over to Neve now, who's going to talk about how the, the development programs that we offer people. Hi everyone, um, thank you for having us. Uh, we were only talking that uh, we don't have a lot of opportunities to actually reflect on such an interesting topic and, and think about actually what we what we do in Needle. Um, development of our employees, um, you know, it's, it's something we're very passionate about in Needle. It's it's um, something I'm particularly passionate about, which is just as well, because it's it's the topic I look after uh, for our colleagues in Needle. And what I wanted to do really was to, to give you a flavor of um, all of the different opportunities from a development perspective that, that we can we could give to our employees. It's, you know, part of our mission statement that um, we ensure that we offer exceptional uh, training and development for, for all of our colleagues um, and ensure not only their safety in work and understanding the role that they do, but giving them the opportunity to grow and support them through, through their own development as well, um, which can only be better for them and for, for us in the future. And, and again, um, you know, we talk about productivity and efficiency and all, all that good stuff. Development to our employees is, is core to that. Um, so just wanted to give you a bit of a flavor of that. Um, so uh, in Lidl, we're, we're um, always uh, looking at the most efficient ways of, of, of doing things. And, and you'll see a couple of these infographics where we try and, and put everything that we want to say on one slide or, or one picture. And really what you're seeing here is all of the different opportunities, um, as I mentioned, from a development perspective that are available to all of our employees across um, Lidl Ireland, Northern Ireland. And that goes from our customer assistance on our shop floor and our warehouse operatives in our, in our warehouses, right up to our, our, our board of directors. Everybody understands that your own personal and professional development is absolutely fundamental to not only your own well-being and your own satisfaction, but to your day-to-day -day job. So the more we can give to our employees, um, we understand the benefit and the, the really positive results that, that we as an organization will, will reap from those. So again, I'm not going to go through all of this. I am going to highlight um, a couple of programs that, that may be of particular interest. Um, but you can see, you know, director development. We have leadership programs for our customer assistance, our warehouse teams, right up to the leadership within those areas of the business. And again, all, all opportunity um, that any of our, our colleagues across the business can, can take up. And um, the two I wanted to talk about uh, very briefly with you guys today, I'll move on to, but uh, you know, probably uh, good to mention that, that we've partnered with DCU this year with their access um, to the workplace program. Unfortunately, COVID, which I know we tried not to mention too much, but COVID unfortunately didn't allow us to, to invite anybody in this year, but it's something we're really, really excited about being able to do at DCU next year. Apprenticeships, are, we have an internship uh, an apprenticeship program up in Northern Ireland, and um, we welcomed interns in um, prior to, to our pandemic um, year. Uh, and it's something that we want to continue doing. We, we look at these people that come in um, as potential graduate program, um, people of the future, potential employees of the future. And, and it's great to, to see people coming in and, and looking at the opportunities that um, Lidl can offer. So um, just to move on then, the two programs I wanted to give you a, a brief view of are um, Feed Your Mind program, which I'll take you through now, and our, our graduate management development program as well. So the management uh, degree program has been up and running since 2018. Um, it is an opportunity for internal, our, our colleagues within Lidl, but also external people who are interested in a career with us to work in our operations area of the business, as well as getting um, a degree level education um, as, as they work with us. Uh, it's something we're really, really passionate about. We're very proud of this program. As I said, uh, it's our third, our third cohort um, have just started with us. Um, and you can see the success has grown since we have started. So um, when we look at last year, we had just over a thousand applications this year. Um, we have over 2000, which is a, an increase of 94%, which is a huge success marker for us. And um, we take advantage of all of the, the opportunities in terms of recruitment we can. You'll see us very heavily uh, on social media um, and all of those channels um, 
so that we can get to, get out there to everybody and, and look at um, the best people who come forward to us. So a really, really um, great number and result for us. And, and hopefully each year um, we see that increase even more. Um, the program itself then is made up. It's um, ultimately after the two years, um, whoever's on this program uh, will receive uh, level seven a degree in management practice and obviously specific uh, specialism in retail and um, we've partnered with Ulster University and Irish Times training and um, the people that join this program work in our operations so they go into our store environment or our warehouse environment um, and they work with us full time but we also give them the opportunity to study a day a week so um, we ensure that they're supported through that. It's not easy to have a full-time job and, and, and do a degree at the same time. And it's something we're very mindful of in terms of giving them uh, the flexibility to be able to do the best they can for, for both their job uh, day to day and, and the college course they're undertaking as well. Um, we had already thought about technology before, before COVID had hit. So we had been very strongly looking at online and uh, webinar type solutions as opposed to a classroom environment. And, and thankfully that has uh, worked out in our favor even more than it would have before March. So again, that adds to the flexibility, the well-being of our employees. They can you know, log into their college um, day at home or, or wherever suits them. So it gives them that um, sense of well-being and, and flexibility. And then we look at all of the leaders and the experienced people within our business to buddy with these uh, new recruits. Uh, we assign the mentors, there's coaches available for them so that they feel secure in, in navigating their way through um, the two years of college, as well as you know learning the ropes and what is an extremely fast paced environment, um, particularly in our stores and our warehouses um, with, our, with our customers as well. So, and um, that's a bit of a flavor feed your mind. As I say, um, we're into our, our third cohort of that um, hugely successful. We're very, very proud of it. Um, we're up to 79 participants over the three um, streams of that program. Um, we actually have a real success story at the moment with uh, one of our first cohort group of cohorts has just taken over store management of our brand new store in, in Galway and Well Park, um, which opened there uh, a couple of weeks ago. So that there are the success stories we're looking for from any sort of development programs. And we and we have plenty of them and, and I can't talk about all of them, but that one just very recently is, is an interesting one to, to let you guys know about. So I'm just gonna move on to the graduate program. So again, we're back to these uh, fit everything on one infographic so that everybody can see each element uh, as, as efficiently and effectively as possible. So our graduate program, um, as some of you, you might be aware of, is an 18 month program. Uh, the real emphasis here is getting to know Lidl and the business that we are in. Um, so therefore, the first number of months of, of the retail or the graduate program rather, is actually going and understanding our business in our, in our operations. So our graduates will go into our store environment and they will go into our warehouse environment and they will learn the ropes uh, within that environment. And something that's really important to us is that whilst you know in the future a role may be in a, a team and head office, like my own role, like Denise's role, it is fundamental for us to understand you know, where most of our employees are, which is in our stores and our warehouses. Um, and therefore, that element of, of the program is, is, is hugely important um, and something that, you know, impacts on really positive results through a head office role potentially in the future, because there's an understanding there of what our teams in store and our teams in warehouse um, are going through on a day to day basis and potentially looking at ways that that can be improved and, and listening to feedback and all of that and um, all of that good stuff as well as understanding our customers who you know are, are obviously at the heart of everything that we we do uh, then when you go along the graduate journey uh, you get a really interesting insight once you come back to um, the office environment depending on what stream of the business you're in and um, you'll get insight into whatever projects happen to be going on at that time you'll get insight into all the areas within that that department that you're in and um, it's real hands-on experience. You're more than likely going to be handed a project to own and to see through for your graduate uh, program and, and, and have that real ownership of, of every element of it and learning your way through it. Um, 
In terms of um, what we offer um, prospective graduates, um, based on that 18 month journey, you can see quite an extensive um, amount of, of touch points within there. Uh, we will tailor training to the stream that you join us with um, and ensure that you get the best, um, the best. Hi, I'm guessing Neve is having some connection problems there. I'm not sure, Molly, if you can give control back to me for the slides and I can attempt to take over from, from Neve. Um, and when she can come back in, then um, I'll let her take back over. Great. Oh, you're oh, back, Neve. I was, just about, I was just about to steal your thunder. Okay. Seven, so seven months you. and never drops in a Zoom call. And today it did. <laughs> Apologies, apologies. I was hoping that wouldn't happen, but thankfully Denise, uh, my trusty sidekick for this part, was ready and going. And um, so, look, I know I don't know whether you heard the last part of of this piece, um, just in terms of what we offer. Really strong package. Um, when you look at lots and lots of different graduate programs, and hopefully we're we're viewed as as one of the the, the best out there. Um, and we've a couple of awards uh, in the past to to, to justify that. Um, so just in terms of the recruitment, then again, successfully like the Feed Your Mind program, our application numbers just keep going up, which is which is really amazing. It gives us a huge pool of, of people to, to be able to select from um, and just goes to show, um, you know, the strength of, of the program that we offer. Um, and again, it, you know, we take it as one of our markers of success that, you know, if there's so many people looking um, at, at our graduate program, then we, we must be doing something right and, and something that interests them. So um, just the, those success stories. So just a couple very quickly. Owen Hurley, we have um, who's with us at the moment. He joined with us in 2015. He actually joined through the finance and accounting stream. Um, he then got an amazing project where he was reporting directly to uh, JSTOR concept um, we, they, he then progressed on to head of stock accounting and then took a complete change of, of scenery and has moved to our purchasing department uh, and is now a senior buyer um, with them uh, Emer O'Sullivan then another uh, success story for us uh, joined the program in 2014 and um, she was social media manager um, and I don't know if anybody remember the infamous or famous or infamous, I don't know which one you want to go with the Lady Ball project. Uh, she then actually took an opportunity and moved to the uh, US uh, when Lidl opened and took over uh, the PR manager role over there and then returned to Ireland um, and took over communications as the senior manager there. So look, it, it's always nice to showcase some success that we've had. And, and as I said before, we have we have plenty more of those success stories. Um, so that's again a bit of a, a really quick view of our graduate program and really just to finish I wanted to touch on on, on two last things and um, this is one of our most recent success stories and um, and we were shocked and delighted I think are the the best words to use for we entered this project which essentially um, was a, a change management project we had built a brand new warehouse in our Newbridge region uh, everybody would have been moving over to this new fancy new office and new warehouse and we could have just left it at that but what we did recognize as a business and we looked for people's feedback on this was how important it was to, to think about our people in this move that it wasn't just a case of I go into this building one day but tomorrow I'll go into a new one we had to look at it uh, in a much much bigger uh, broader way um, and this project I am um, delighted at the HR leadership management awards we actually won the, the best change management program. And certainly to our delight, and Adele probably would have seen the shock um, from Laura on that day, um, was that we ended up winning the overall excellence in HR award as well, which, which was 
really nice external recognition for us um, and always delighted to, um, to be able to, to, to share that um, and to get some recognition, which is great. So look, um, just really quickly, um, the new two new project uh, that ended up being the name of, of the, the, the change management piece and, and bringing people um, into the new world of new two. Um, it was really about employ empowering our employees and recognizing, as I said, that need for, you know, that transition piece to be something that we took as seriously as the building being built, you know, what furniture was going in, how's the IT structure going to be done. And um, our people were really core to that. And a, a really positive piece of Lidl is that we recognize our employees and everything that we do. Um, and we always account for them in anything that we're changing, anything that we're, you know, revamping or whatever transition for our people is, is as, as smooth and as uh, seamless as, as possible. Um, this took a year of planning. Um, the build took obviously a little bit longer, but again, we looked at making sure that we could do the very best we could do it and spent quite a, a lot of time, not just my team and, and Denise's team, but huge collaboration across many, many teams in, um, in Lidl to make sure that we, we got everything as right as we could. Um, lots of things that we did, again, just a, a little um, insight. We did a lot of leadership workshops. So obviously recognizing that the leadership in Newbridge region in particular was fundamental to ensuring our, our colleagues were secure and comfortable uh, with everything that changed and was changing for them. So we wanted to make sure that at the very senior level, we were getting uh, those leaders uh, in, involved and engaged and motivated to, to, to drive this piece. Uh, we also looked at, um, sorry, I got a bit excited there. And all of this work that we did over the 12 months built up to, to, to the opening day that was on the 29th um, of October last year. Uh, all of the regional distribution center employees attended. It was um, opened in with great fanfare, ribbons cut uh, by some of our longest serving employees down in the, in the region in Newbridge. Niall Murray, our regional director, um, uh, gave a speech to open up and we we created a day that was fun and engaging and gave people a really good insight into into their new world we had different stations built around Newbridge the new Newbridge uh, we had a gym tour which um you know was, was something very new and and again feeds into to the well-being for for our employees we had we're giving people opportunities now to, to look in me and in the world that we're living in now um, and we looked at different elements like that um, and it was a really really interesting successful day and ultimately it it, it gave people the opportunity to be enthusiastic and, and um, enjoy make the, the change enjoyable which which we feel um, based on, on, as always with Lidl, we uh, look at what what the results will be. Apologies, something's not going on. Oh. Uh, so successful outcome, apologies, uh, my wife right now, I'll have to sack it. Um, so in terms of successful outcomes, and, and one of the measurements we, we looked at using for this was logistically, we transferred over 33,000 pallets uh, and rotations to new warehouse in 24 hours, which was a huge undertaking and, and a real success of it. Uh, there was virtually no impact on store, um, which again, there, there could have been huge impacts, uh, which not only would have affected our store teams, but our customers as well. Uh, and we, from a human resources perspective, have transferred over 2,000 employees with uh, quite a long time to plan with quite a lot of um, uh, collaboration and, and individual contributions. And very lastly, just the last minute for me, um, culminating in all of that stuff is, is how we communicate with our employees. So we have many, many different touch points 
to be able to keep people informed, to be able to communicate directly with them. Um, and you can see there, there's just some images of the app that everybody can access. We have screens in store that all of our teams uh, can get information of. And that, that screen there is, is just one of those um, uh, screenshot of, of different opportunities they have to, to look at different pieces. So look, I think that probably wraps it up and probably over time as I usually am with that stuff. Um, and look, I guess any questions you have, uh, this was just a montage, a nice way to end, um, end our piece today. So that's us. Denise and Eve, I want to say a huge thank you. There's just so many initiatives uh, going on that demonstrate um, evidence of you providing decent work um, and even in, in Lidl's growth in terms of its, its contribution to um, the economy as well. Um, I have a, a question, I have two questions. Um, the first one is, how do you manage your brand um, in terms of getting those messages out there? You're, you've always had a strong uh, brand from a recruitment perspective, um, but how do you compete uh, in the space that you're in, uh, in terms of attracting uh, talent and, and graduates and employees in general? Um, yeah, I, I think Adele, we, we try to, to, to look at all of the opportunities out there. So I think certainly in the last number of years, we've absolutely utilized every opportunity we have through our social media campaigns. I think lots of people will recognize our Twitter accounts and our Instagram accounts and all of those things where not only do we use it to generate a bit of fun, you know, there's always great talk. We've recently, you know, had our fashion models for our needle runners and all of those kind of things up, up on our social media, but we also use them to optimize recruitment opportunities and to really sell ourselves in terms of what we can offer um, people. Um, so I think it's just capitalizing on, on all of those opportunities. And, and again, that collaboration between all of the different teams that can impact on that. Every one of our teams within HR has an opportunity to impact externally through all those opportunities as well as, as every other team in, 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 our, in our business. So yeah, I think we just, we try to seize, seize the day you know, and, and with career, the, even the grad campaigns, I guess this year, it turned us upside down. We couldn't do on campus, anything like that. But again, with your, you, you know, colleges, we just looked at how we could do that virtually and make it as impactful as we could. And you just, I guess, change your approach. I think also what we really tried to do is try, try our best to be really authentic about how we advertise our roles and who we are. Um, I think I touched on it briefly, but we are fast paced. We're not the same as every other retailer, let alone every other grocery retailer. So we don't pretend to be someone that we're not. We don't pretend to be, you know, a, a Google or a Facebook. But we're Lidl and um, we provide very fair work. We have amazing compensation packages, but um, we, yeah, we're not easy to work for. I think we'd be lying if we said that. So. Yeah, and I think it's very um, heartwarming to see that your talent management is not about exclusive talent. It's about the talent mm -hmm. management of everybody. Mm -hmm. yeah. You mentioned it's about every employee and, and identifying uh, opportunities for them. I have a, a, a question from an anonymous attendee um, and they want to thank you for a great talk and they found it very insightful. Um, and the question is legal employees per store is just over 30 versus super value employees per store, which is over 60. I'm not sure where uh, these numbers are coming from, but can you explain this difference and whether it be down to store size or efficiency? Yeah, so how we decide, I suppose, how many people work in a store. So I, I don't know if 30 is, is an accurate figure, but it depends. We look at the store space and we look at the turnover of the store. So how much how much turnover the store is generating and our, our staffing levels fluctuate then based on what that turnover is. Um, we are definitely different, as I said, to other grocery retailers. Um, and we have every year look at how we can make our processes more efficient. Um, we will do time and motion studies to see exactly how long it takes to pack out an individual pallet and everything. There's an, like an exact science um, as to how we then calculate how many people per store. But efficiency and being lean is, is one of our, our core principles. We even had... We had an a, a efficiency event, I think it was maybe two years ago, Neve, mm, um, yeah. where we all came to a big space in swords 
um, and basically showed how change in small little things and the impact that has mm-hmm. on your whole day, your whole week, the whole year. And, and we constantly change how we do things to make them as efficient as possible. So, um, yeah, I, I would say we're definitely more efficient and leaner in how we do things than other retailers. And that's how we manage to um, have less people um, in the store. Yeah, and that's that's not a bad thing either. Um, so we're just coming up to time. So once again, I'd like to say a massive thank you. Uh, I'm very familiar with the work of Lidl, obviously through uh, my work with the HR Leadership and Management Awards. Uh, and I was really delighted to see that you won the, the overall award, which I really do believe is testament, not only you know, for the, the change program this year, and, and uh, but also there's so much evidence of so many initiatives that you're undertaking and um, that really do provide evidence. And those awards that you get are external validation mm-hmm. of the excellent uh, initiatives that you're undertaking. So uh, I'm going to close off by saying again, thanks so much for your time. Uh, it's really appreciated. It was really, really insightful um, and good to know about everything that you're doing. Um, so on behalf of everybody here at Transform Work, I'd like to say thanks. And for everybody else listening in, I'd like to uh, remind you that these events are going on uh, for the rest of the week. So tomorrow and Friday, uh, we'll have other events as well. So on that note, I'll say thank you again, Neve and Denise, um, and no doubt our paths will cross uh, again too. Okay, thanks. Thank everyone. you. Thanks, thanks everyone. Thanks everyone. Bye bye. Bye.